All right. Well, according to uh, according to the clock on the wall here, it is two o'clock. Again, my name is Steve Marzoff. I'm the Integrated Services Program Director, and welcome to our latest installment of Webinar Wednesday. Um, we do these webinars for the, the PSAP and GIS community in, in Virginia to, um, to to provide information, and they are for your benefit. So um, please feel free if you have questions um, that you, as we move through the material, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask them. We want to make sure you get your questions answered. Um, today we have, uh, I'm very pleased that we have John Powers um, on on the phone with us to talk about the Virginia radio cache uh, or communications cache. You may not be aware, um, but through the interoperability program um, in the Commonwealth, there's been uh, a number of uh, the radio caches that have been implemented and spread throughout Virginia. And it is a great resource uh, for emergency response. Um, you know, should you have a need in, in your community. So. Um, uh, Again, please mute your phones so that we don't get the background noise, star six on the phone, or um, just muting your phone, pound six to unmute, um, and feel free to ask questions as we go through. And with that, John, I turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, well, as Steve said, uh, I'm John Powers. I actually work in with the uh, PSAP in the city of Roanoke, uh, but one of the uh, the the opportunities that I've had is about five years ago I got associated with the Virginia Communications Cash Program and I've been working with that ever since and I think it's a great uh, asset and a great program for the state and I want to give you an overview of what the program is all about some of the capabilities that the uh, the cash system brings to you and in particular some things that I think uh, may be beyond what a lot of people think about when they first think about the, the cash program that could be a benefit uh, to your PSAPs. Um, so without further ado, I'll tell you, you know, what is a cash? Well, you know, we talk about the communications cache. A cache is by definition a collection of items of the same type stored in a place. So, you know, as it shows in the, the picture I have, there are a lot of people immediately think when we talk about communications cache, well, it's just a, a, a bunch of radios somewhere. It's a bunch of radios that are stored that I can call on. Um, and, and that is true. That is one of the, the big attributes of the cache. But I uh, hope that during this presentation I'll explain to you that we view the communications cache of Virginia as being a lot more than that and has actually brings more things to the table to help you out. Um, so what is the communications cache? Well, it was actually a program that's managed by the Virginia Department of Emergency Management as part of our strategic radio cache program. Um, there's five teams, regional teams, located throughout the state of Virginia. There's a Montgomery uh, team in Montgomery County, Virginia, Fairfax, Harrisburg, Rockingham, Lunenburg, and Chesapeake. And those five teams are fairly uh, geographically diverse throughout the state, as you can see in the next slide. So we have a little bit of coverage pretty much uh, wherever you may be. Uh, there may not be a team right in your, your county, but we have one pretty much in every region to help uh, provide support. The, uh, the teams are intended to be completely self-contained and self-supporting. So if you do have an incident and you need it to call the team to come in and assist you, what we don't want to do is put a lot of extra burden on your, your logistics at that incident. So when the teams come in, we, we intend the teams to be able to sustain themselves uh, and you know, provide whatever capabilities that you requested without adding a burden to you. So what kind of, what kind of assets do the teams bring well you know as the, the the cash definition kind of implies we do have a collection of equipment uh probably the biggest thing in the inventory one of the biggest cost of the whole program were these portable radios uh, we have over 2,000 portable radios in the cache system available for deployment. Now, those are spread amongst those five teams, but as you can imagine, that is a considerable amount of, uh, of investment and equipment. We do have a variety. We cover all of the primary public safety bands. We have VHF, UHF, 7, 800 megahertz. Our radios are both analog and digital conventional capability, and they also have the ability to support P25 trunk systems, 
and the Motorola and Harris proprietary analog and digital trunking systems. So our intent is to have equipment that's pretty much compatible with the systems that are in use in the state of Virginia. Um, as, and we do have a variety of equipment there to, uh, to support that. We also have a set of mobile radios and antennas that can be used as temporary base stations. Uh, we can set those up to support patches between radio systems. Uh, we can do patches into the state star system, the state uh, statewide radio system, or state agency radio system. Um, we also have the capability to operate these on the national mutual aid channels. Uh, if you're familiar with the National Interoperability Field Operations Guide or NIFOG, we have all those channels for our radios. Uh, we also have state mutual aid channels, and with permission, they can be programmed to operate on your local frequencies. As I mentioned, we have the ability to patch. If you're familiar with the Comlink system, we have uh, both uh, trailer mounted and tactical portable Comlink interoperability gateways, so we can use those to patch in to radio systems, patch your radio system with your neighbor's radio system, or to patch in any of these national interoperability channels. One of the, the unique features that can be beneficial to a PSAP is we can use portable laptops tied into our Comlink system and use the laptops as sort of a uh, 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 a limited radio console. So if you had an, an issue with a PSAP where your radio communications consoles were down, if we brought a communications cache team in, we could set up some laptop computers tied into our uh, Comlink system and provide you the laptops that can be used as your radio console. And it would provide you a lot of your normal radio console features, the ability to multi-select channels, to be able to patch channels, be able to monitor multiple channels at one time. Uh, so, you know, it's not as full featured as the, the, the front end radio consoles, but it's it's a lot better than just having a portable radio setting there. So it does provide you some some console type capabilities. In addition to the radios that we've talked about, we also have repeater systems. Uh, we have repeaters that are both uh, tactical uh, repeaters that we can use to uh, set up a, a repeater system at a remote site, like around here in this part of Virginia. We use a lot of mountaintops. Uh, as you can see in the picture, they're relatively small. Um, we have repeaters available in both VHF, UHF, 7-800 megahertz. We also have repeaters that can do both analog and uh, P25 digital. The tactical repeaters, as I said, are, are small, self-contained. They actually can be left unattended. And, but in addition to the tactical repeaters, we have some infrastructure repeaters, which are mounted in our tower of trailers, which I'll talk about a little bit more. In, but with the infrastructure repeaters, they actually are the same capabilities, but because they are not they don't have to be as miniaturized they are more powerful and so they can actually cover a little bit larger area we don't have as many of those but we can bring those up and those are essentially the same kind of repeaters that that you would probably use in your your uh, your your designed radio system that you may have in your locality I did mention we have deployable towers and mast you can see in some of the pictures there we have tower units uh, some tower units are over 100 foot elevation. Uh, we also have just uh, man portable masts, as you can see in the picture on the right there. That's a, a mast we can set up pretty much anywhere. We can carry it in to a remote site, set up that, that mast, and put antennas on that. Uh, obviously, the, the tower systems are, are self contained, um, but you know, they do have, we do have to be able to drive them into wherever we need to do that coverage. So some of the things that you know a lot of people don't think about, a lot of people originally think of the communications cache as being a cache of radios. But we've found over the years that in you know modern communications, it's more about uh, things beyond radios. The first thing we hear on a lot of missions we go on is, well, hey, I need to get my cell phone to work. I need to get on the internet. You know, I, I, yeah, I need to have a radio, but if I can't get on the internet, I can't do. Uh, I can't operate my cell phone, then you know I'm 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 
severely hampered in being able to do my mission. So one of the uh, systems that we have as part of the communications cache is a very small aperture terminal or VSAT satellite system. With this system, we can set up these satellite dishes as you see here, and they can provide us the ability to provide internet connectivity um, pretty much completely independent of any local infrastructure. It uses a, set, a commercial satellite system, and you know we are, then provide you upload and download capability onto the internet. Um, with these systems, we can also connect them in and provide a limited number of voice over IP phone lines. We have five of these satellite systems, and they actually can be ganged together, or we can dynamically adjust the bandwidth by combining multiple accounts. So if we had one really large incident, we could set up a dish and provide multiple, you know, a larger bandwidth, or we can split them up around the state and provide smaller amount of bandwidth to each site. We also have deployable satellite phones, and these are, uh, you've seen them in a lot of vehicles. That's a satellite phone that's independent of this system, but allows us to go somewhere and get make, you know, just simple phone calls or do a small amount of data over the satellite phones. So one of the things about the VSAT, though, we, if we set up the VSAT, we have to have a clear line of sight for that system to be able to see the satellites, and the satellites, of course, are in orbit over the West Coast, so there's a lot of places where we have a hard time getting that that are close to the incidents that we're trying to support. So one of the capabilities we've added in the last year is a deployable networking or point-to-point -point Internet system. So basically, we can set this system up near where our VSAT is, or if you have existing network connections somewhere, we can set this up and share this wirelessly uh, with multiple points. So with, as you can see in the kind of example in the picture there, I can put up one base station and have three different locations that are able to uh, get internet, internet off of that one base location. And they can be up to, you know, about eight, ten miles away. So again, if you had an issue where you lost internet somewhere you really needed it, but you had internet nearby, or we could set up a VSAT nearby. We could use this point-to-point -point networking system to share that internet connection over uh, over several different sites and get the people back connected. I mentioned cell phones earlier. One of the things that we've uh, run into on a lot of deployments is, again, the desire or the need to get cell phone connectivity. And there are a lot of places where cell phone uh, access may not be adequate. So we do have uh, some deployable cell phone boosters. Um, the nice thing about these boosters, you basically, if there's, if there's inter cell phone service, but it's just not strong enough for you to really get a reliable signal, we can set up this system where we point an antenna at the nearest cell phone site and amplify it so that you get a, an adequate signal to use your phone. There has to be cell phone service. It's just very weak cell phone service, and this will amplify it up so you don't have to, that problem. The advantage of this system is it works with multiple carriers. Any carrier that's on the antenna that we're pointing at or the tower that we're pointing at or close to the towers we're pointing at will be amplified, and everybody within range of that can use use this system. So, again, you know, we've done a couple of deployments where we've used this and uh, made a, a world of difference between not people not being able to use their phone or being able to get them up to a full-strength signal that they can actually use and communicate. But what happens if we don't have set, uh, internet, or excuse me, don't have cell phone service at all? There's no cell phone service nearby. Then the other option we have is the the commercial uh, small uh, access points. Basically, it's a miniature cell phone site. We can deploy. Uh, it uses an internet connection, so again, we can deploy, we can set up our VSAT system to get on the internet, and then provide set one of these up and provide a small number of cell phone users cell phone signal. It's limited to a single carrier. Right now we only have Verizon with our system, uh, but it does allow us to provide a, a limited amount of cell phone access where there would be none at all without this capability. And part of this also is we are recently added a deployable um, telephone system. It's a voice over IP telephone where we have up to 10 phones per team, and we can we can attach multiple teams together to provide this, uh, where we can go up, and if your, your 
telephone systems were completely out. We could set up our uh, satellite system, get these connected in, and have you 10 telephones with up to 10 telephone lines operational for you to be able to again, be back on. That's a capability that could be useful in a PSAP. Now, obviously, these are not designed to do 911 data, uh, but if you had absolutely a complete phone outage and no ability to take phone calls at all, we could deploy this system in, get you phone lines up, and then try to get your 911 lines rerouted to these uh, these 10 digit phone lines that you could at least start taking calls again. Uh, they do have the capability to do uh, fax. We have fax adapters for them. And again, as I said, we can connect multiple systems together so we could have up to 50 phones at any particular site. So we have a lot of money invested in this equipment. We do use an automated asset tracking system, so all of our stuff is barcoded. We have a little database where we can check out the assets and kind of keep track of it because obviously we want to uh, you know, be good stewards of the tax dollars. Uh, but the nice thing about that system is that we have visibility on all the assets for the whole Virginia Communications case, no matter which of the five teams they belong to. We all have them in one common database to keep track of. So one of the things about deploying the cache teams, even though we have five teams, all the teams have compatible equipment and we train together. We do a quarterly training exercise where all five teams get together and we work, to, we work as one. Uh, we've done some very interesting uh, exercises, but the benefit to you is that you know, all of our assets can be shared between any team. So if uh, you called for the Montgomery team to deploy in and we came in and we decided we needed additional phones or we needed more radios or we needed a, another piece of equipment that we didn't have, we can call one of the other teams and they can come in and bring that equipment. They also, we, use, we augment each other for manpower. So if something becomes more of a long-term event, then you know one team may go in and start, and then as it goes on to you know longer and longer time period, additional teams will come in and augment each other, and you know that works well because we all train together, we're used to each other, we know where everybody's equipment is and how everybody's equipment works. Um, so you know that that's a benefit of the way we've deployed this system in the state. Even though it's five independent teams, we're really just one system. When we deploy in, we have, you know, we can either augment your existing system. If you needed additional radios, your system's fine. You just have some event occurs and you need to put more people out there. You brought in mutual aid, whatever. We can just provide equipment in, and with your permission, we program it and use it on your existing radio system. Or, if necessary, we can deploy our own repeaters, our own equipment, and make a completely independent system. And you know, if your system is either impaired or you just need to keep whatever incident it is off of your system because your system's already overloaded, then we would put up an independent system and try to, to uh, provide the, whatever resources you need that way. The response is always based on your needs. So we can do full or partial complement of equipment depending upon what, what, what you need and the manpower, whatever is necessary to support your, your actual mission. Um, one of the things that I'll point out is we do a lot of planned events and exercises in addition to supporting emergency and disaster responses. Um, so, you know, we, we do a variety of, of planned events, too, so it's not just for when the big one happens. It's anything that, you know, we can do to help you accomplish your mission. Our deployment time will vary, uh, but generally we can be on location in two to four hours from the time that we're requested. Uh, training, all of our personnel are trained as, as communication leaders through Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we also have communications technicians, radio operators, and all of our people are trained on the NIMS or ICS system. So a communication leader, their primary role is to come in and help fi help figure out the planning of what resources are needed, help with requesting additional resources, help figure out how to manage the communications of whatever events you have going. The communications technicians, they're more technical in nature. They're the ones that can, can get in there and help uh, 
rewire telephone circuits, put in new network circuits. Um, you know, they're, they're more the hands-on technical people. The ComLs are the the planners um, and leaders of the of the radio system. And our people are generally trained in in more than one of these disciplines. So, in a, I said, in addition to uh, deployments, we also do a lot of planned events. We do uh, football games. Uh, we do all of the Virginia Tech and uh, uh, JMU football games. We do uh, uh, races. Uh, we do fairs. And there's a variety of a lot of, of planned events we do throughout the year. And you know that's a benefit to us because it exercises our equipment. And hopefully, it's a benefit to those people that are hosting these events because it helps them uh, have enough resources to support what. You know, the event that's going on. To give you an idea of the activity, in the Montgomery team, we did we have completed about 40 deployments in 2016, uh, and you can see it's about a ratio of two to one of uh, planned events over uh, actual emergency deployments. And on those events in 2016, we have some roughly 1,300 man hours of support we've provided to other locations in Virginia. So a couple of the recent deployments that we've been through, uh, there was a military aircraft crash in Augusta County. You can see some of the pictures there. We actually had uh, three teams, I believe it was, deployed to that. Initially started with just one team, but we brought additional teams in. During that event, we provided all of the Internet access. Uh, we provided a lot of satellite telephones. They actually had some pretty good radio communications. We augmented that a little bit and helped them uh, issue radios out and use some of our radio equipment. But one of the big contributors there was the internet access because it was really uh, in the middle of nowhere and there was a lot of a uh, lot of need for for uh, communications on uh, computer communications. Uh, one of the big deployments we've had was the search for Hannah Graham in Charlottesville. On that deployment, we actually had all five of the cache teams deploy there. Um, you can see a little bit in the picture there. We actually deployed, uh, we issued, I don't remember the number, but we issued, uh, I think it was like 2,000 radios. Um, you can see that we actually provided five independent uh, radio operator positions where we staff those with communication team members and each of those were covering a different geographical area of the search. So we were able to do that without putting any of that burden on the local PSAP. We actually uh, provided all the radio operators and you know managed that search resource there for that search. Um, in February 2016 we deployed uh, two teams into Appomattox to help with uh, uh, the state assets that were in there doing hazard mitigation and search and rescue after the tornadoes. Uh, we set up uh, repeaters and tower units and um, provided four days worth of support there as they went through and tried to mitigate all the, the hazardous materials that were, were spread around because of that tornado. Again, I mentioned that we do quarterly statewide training exercises. Uh, we've done a variety of uh, interesting concepts there, everything from how do you provide communications through a large ship, how do you provide communications into a uh, cave or a cavern. Um, we've done communications in places where, you know, buildings where there's limited communications like um, underground water treatment plants. So, uh, you know, we try to look for uh, different challenges and figure out how we would uh, prepare for those and then train with uh, those in mind. We do a lot of support for search and rescue, as I mentioned already. So, you know, uh, again, I think that's one of the strengths of our system is that we work together as all, all the teams to accomplish our, our task. So if you did have a need for a cash asset, how would you request them? You request them through the Virginia Emergency Operations Center. Uh, I have the number listed there. Or you can contact one of the team managers directly. If you don't know the team managers in your area and you're interested, I have my uh, contact information at the end of this PowerPoint. Uh, we're more than glad to have you contact me. I can get you in touch with those. Generally, if it's a, a planned event, um, you know, like I mentioned, the sporting events or something like that, 
it's probably better to work directly with the team, see what uh, you know what availability they'd have, and then they can schedule and work with you to to uh, do any pre-planning before they come. If it's an emergency deployment, then by all means call the Virginia EOC to get someone there as quickly as we can. Uh, we do operate as a statewide mutual aid asset, so if you request it through VDM, that's uh, generally the way it's done is statewide mutual aid. Um, again, most planned events can be supported at little or no cost. Actual deployments may require reimbursement of operating expenses depending upon the duration. Um, we we do a lot of our training money to help support uh, deployments, especially planned events. So, you know, it's generally not going to be something that's going to cost you a lot. But uh, we, you know, we may have to if we're there for a long time. We may have to reimburse fuel and a few other things. So that's basically a quick overview of the Virginia Communications Cache. And again, you know, I'd like to to point out that. It's not just radios, it's uh, the whole communication spectrum. And, you know, we are, you know, again, I think we do have assets that can help you and your PSAP in either radio systems, radio consoles, or even telephone service. Uh, but, um, you know, I hope that gives you a better idea of what the communications cache is all about. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to entertain them at this time. Thanks, John. Steve Marzoff here. Uh, are there any questions for, for John? And and I, I'll, I'll ask a question for the, for the group just to make sure that uh, everyone un is understand that um, uh, what's the cost to a locality if they were to call out the cash uh, and 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 ask uh, or call VDEM and request the cash and the cash were to come out and and operate. What's the cost to a locality for doing that? So uh, if it's a planned event, it's generally no cost. You know, if if you need us to come in to support, like we did the presidential, uh, uh, vice presidential debate at Longwood this year, um, and, you know, we do those kind of appointments generally as we use our training monies to do. And so, uh, you know, we'll pay our travel expenses and we'll pay our operating expenses to do those. Uh, that's why we ask that, you know, those are better to coordinate directly with the teams and we'll figure out a way to do that uh, in a way that, that's affordable for all of us. If it's an emergency deployment, uh, we will deploy and then, then figure out how, what the costs are going to be that have to be reimbursed. So far, I don't believe that uh, we've ever had a deployment that costs a locality anything other than maybe a little bit of money for uh, fuel, and that can be just they provide fuel on site while we're there. Uh, obviously, if it lasts a long time and we do have expenses, then you know we we would run that through the, the mutual aid construction in the state to try to get reimbursed. So there's not a, a clear you know it's ten dollars an hour or anything like that. Uh, generally, you know, uh, it's most important that we just get the support in there and we'll figure out how to uh, make the finances work. Uh, and often, uh, this is Steve Marzoff, and often there, uh, when there's a declared disaster, a declared emergency by either the federal or the state level, um, that funding for the cash can be worked out through VDEM, just like any other, you know, VDOT responding or any other uh, state resource that's responding. Right. Like a, a hazmat team or a technical rescue team or any of those things, uh, you know, I, I I just offer that you know I would never let the the cost be the consideration because you know um, we'll find a way to make it happen. Um, but obviously, each of these teams, and I, I guess I, I I glossed over mentioning that each of these teams, even though they were originally funded by federal grant money, uh, they are sustained by localities that are supporting them. So, you know, uh, the the cost of vehicle maintenance, the cost of uh, fuel, oil, all that stuff are borne by those localities. Um, and, you know, they, they obviously they signed an MOU, we want to support the state. But if it's going to be something <clears throat> that, you know, was unplanned and going to take a uh, considerable resource, then we need to, to try to find a way to recoup those expenses. Any other questions for John? I mean, obviously, this is a, an, an incredible resource in our strategic technology reserve to be able to call out because, I mean, whether it's the phones that John mentioned for uh, a PSAP that may need it or data uh, for some sort of 
uh, an operation in an area you don't usually have a data capability or or whether it is just the radios, just needing a ton of radios to hand out to the, the various responders to an emergency. And I think the Heather Graham uh, incident was probably the, the largest that I know of uh, where the cash actually, as John mentioned, all the caches responded and, and provided some services because they needed, A, it was such a large geographic area that they were searching, and B, uh, well, there's a large number of people they were trying to coordinate, and they also had um, uh, a, a distinct operations that were going on, you know, different investigative uh, search and rescue and so forth and so on. So, um, uh, you know, that's a good example of an incident, you know, dead smack in the middle of the state that required uh, all of the different types of resources. That's true. A any questions for... Yes. Go ahead. Oh, hi. This is Carolyn from Alexandria. How are you? Thank you for your presentation. That's very useful. I work with the IMT uh -huh. um, in the NCR, and I had a question on deployment. Um, I wrote down the number for the VOC. Um, if the IMT was deployed locally, um, would and, and we wanted to lean forward and call out the radio cache, would we go through the Fairfax, I mean, since we're right next door to Fairfax, would we call Fairfax EOC or should we call the state EOC? Well, the uh, their, their Fairfax cache team, which is also with uh, a lot of co-members with the NCR cache up there, uh, I mean, if you called the Fairfax EOC, they probably would call the Fairfax team directly. Uh, but if if they're going to deploy, especially out of their jurisdiction, they're going to refer it up to the EOC to get a state mission number, just to make sure that you know the state's aware of what the resources are being used for, and, and you know we we manage it that way. Uh, I, I will uh, mention I, I understood that they just they did deploy some resources to help with the recent incident in Alexandria too. Ah uh, yes. But did that, that answer your question? I mean, you could actually go either way. Uh, if you call the EOC, they're going to, to page the uh, the cash teams and generally get someone uh, responding to you pretty quickly. One of our first things is to try to make contact with that local contact and figure out what kind of resources you're looking for. One of the things that we've we're, we're ramping up to do, and you know, we've we've is with any other thing we've learned a lot of lessons over the years and trying to to uh, modify so we've added you know like this this uh, networking capabilities and those things because we saw that was more of a need than originally planned but one of the things we've started doing is what we call a rapid comm program where if there is an incident going on and you're not really sure what's going to happen or what's going to evolve that you can call and ask us to send a COMEL, someone that's that's trained in communications planning, and they can respond in as a single person, single vehicle, just to be there to help advise your incident command that okay, you know, you know, you may not need anything from the cache, but we have people that you know uh, have more experience and more training on how to manage communications. So you know, not every fire chief or police chief or our, our field commander is going to have a, a lot of experience in figuring out how to to manage communication. You know, they use communication every day, but but mm -hmm. you know, the, they it may go beyond what they're used to dealing with. So one of the, the things we're trying to offer is, you know, a, a trained COMEL as a response asset just to come in and help advise them. So. Okay, that's good to know as well. And thanks for um, reminding me of the distinction between the NCR cache and the state cache. Yeah, we we there's a lot we of overlap, with, a lot of same yeah, people. Yeah, a lot of the same people and a lot of the same equipment and, and we, we, we work together very well. Um but you know, they are two distinctly different things. So you guys kinda have the both of both uh, the best of both worlds. You have both you can call them. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um All right. the technology Thank solutions you. you're providing are um are really critical to us as well as the communications to our incident command posts when we get deployed. So Appreciate the right. um, added technology. Thank you. Thank you. And this is uh, Steve Marzoff. One thing to keep in mind, these are state teams. They, they are locally maintained, much like the hazmat teams or anything else. So um, there is a chance, as slim as it might be with the amount of resources that we have, that when you call for one, it's not available, or the local one's not available. Fairfax could be 
at an event in Prince William or, or something along those lines. Um, it is like any other state resource or cache like this, like the hazmat teams or whatever. The, the EOC will be the ones who ultimately determine the prioritization and where it's going to go because during a to take like a hurricane scenario um, uh, type of operation where there could be shelters that are set up that may need emergency communications. There may be family assistance centers if we have some sort of structural collapse or some major incident. There could be the field operations in a number of different jurisdictions depending on flooding and wind damage. Um, you know, there could be any number of things that are going on all at one time. Um, and we have had uh, the, the, the caches leave the state before um, when it was deemed appropriate. In fact, I believe Fairfax took uh, part of their cash to Haiti during the uh, the earthquake in Haiti. So um, there, it is a resource that needs to be managed, and it is managed at the state level to determine greatest need and that sort of thing. So you, you definitely, um, uh, uh, for the state resources, best to go through the state EOC. Other questions for John before we wrap up? Going once, twice. Well, I want to thank you again, John, for, for the presentation. It's very important that I, I believe every locality understand what resources are available to them to help them manage the incident. As you mentioned, we communicate every day, but we don't always manage that communications um, as well as we need to during those, those peak load, those peak demand situations. And this is a, resources, a resource that can help um, uh, offset that peak load that, that nobody's local radio system is designed to handle. So thank you for taking the time to present today. Thank you all for participating. Uh, the recording of this will be on our website, I would say shortly, but they're about to take our website down for a major redesign, so it may take a little while for the recording to get up there uh, during that, that uh, uh, content lockdown freeze. But otherwise, uh, it will be on our website that you can listen to it again or share with others. Um, and uh, otherwise, thank you for participating and have a great day. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Great presentation.